Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, and where David meets Goliath on the Internet, the global battle for access. Welcome back to the Listening Post, the program that keeps a watchful eye on global media just to make sure they behave. Iranians who can usually get to Internet sites like Amazon and YouTube have also been denied access. Iran's government periodically cracks down on Internet activity and the use of satellite dishes, often around election time. Coming up in part two, how to beat the censors in Iran and elsewhere with the help of friends, family, and a new smart piece of software. When people talk about internet censorship, this is what they mean. If you're in Cairo or Frankfurt and you search for images of Tiananmen Square on Google.com, all kinds of pictures will come up, including some of the famous images from the protests back in 1989. Do the same thing in China on Google.cn and you'll see nothing. The Chinese government can't stop you from seeing those images, but it can stop its own people, and China's not the only country that's doing this. But there are some rebellious elements out there who have developed ways of getting around the walls that some governments have built on the net. This week, they launched a new weapon in the battle for access, what they call circumvention software. It's free, but the only way it will work is if people all over the world effectively lend their computers to Internet users in countries where governments tend to get in the way. There is a battle going on in cyberspace for control of the Internet between ordinary people who want to use the net to send and receive information freely, governments who are using it to control and monitor people, and big businesses looking to make a profit. They are a mini-web within the World Wide Web, and they call themselves the Open Net Initiative, a group of academics and computer geeks from Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, and here at the University of Toronto. Not the most likely setting for informational warfare, but that's what they do here. They even have their own bunker. This month, the Toronto team, which calls itself Citizen Lab, unveiled its latest weapon in the fight for Internet freedom, a piece of computer software called Siphon. We're going up against some of the world's largest security and intelligence organizations that, that have a vested interest in doing the opposite. Um, our target audience, the bottom line, is anybody who wants to access information online and engage in freedom of speech. I mean, this is what the Internet was originally about. There are a lot of different circumvention technologies out there, and uh, most of them have a, an Achilles heel that we tried to overcome with Siphon. Usually the method by which people get around Internet content filtering is to have people in uncensored locations uh, put up large public proxy computers, computers that uh, people in censored countries can connect to and surf the internet freely. Um, but to do that, you have to advertise the connection information to people who live behind national firewalls. Now, once you advertise that information, it doesn't take long usually for authorities to figure out um, the connection information and put that on a block list. The siphon approach is to connect people through small independent networks. So if someone in Tunisia, where the net can be censored, knows and trusts someone in London, they can access the internet through the Londoner's computer. So what we did with Siphon was to take it below the radar screen and to have it operate on social networks of trust. In other words, rather than having one large proxy computer that everyone connects to, instead you have hundreds, maybe thousands of people install Siphon on their home computers and only give out the connection information to a handful of friends or family members that they know personally, that they trust. That way, they keep the Siphon networks closed and compartmentalized and under the radar screen of the authorities. Their toughest adversary is China, which has one of the most advanced censorship systems in the world. The Great Firewall of China blocks nearly 20,000 sites, including the BBC, Voice of America, and Wikipedia. A 35,000-strong cyber police force patrols the net, making sure topics such as Tiananmen Square, Taiwan, Falun Gong, and the Dalai Lama stay off limits. So far this year, 62 Chinese citizens have been arrested for Internet use. Bin He, a Falun Gong practitioner, says he was tortured and jailed by Chinese authorities for his beliefs. He now lives in London, but his brother is still a prisoner. 
as far as we know officially more than 300 Falun Gong practitioners that's officially been arrested and sentenced because of their internet usage. My brother was sentenced to three years in prison. The so-called evidence for them to sentence him is some emails. The last thing the Siphon team wants is to put people in danger, so Siphon connections are encrypted. In this case, we're not protecting someone's credit card information, we're protecting the fact that they're at Wikipedia. But the system is not infallible. If you're under surveillance, they can still see that this computer is talking to this computer. They just don't know what you're saying. Um, so that, that's why the, the, the real issue becomes a human security issue. Um, if, if implication is enough to bring you in for questioning, then that's a problem technically that we can't solve. In Iran, the censors have turned their attention to the country's active blogging scene. Hussein Durkashan, an outspoken blogger, received a warning from the intelligence ministry when he last visited Iran. They told me these taboos that I had broken. The first one is criticizing the supreme leader or talking in a not very appropriate language about him. So then it was the nuclear program. He was very disturbed about one specific thing that I had written. Any kind of um, individual approach or personal approach or hum human approach to this problem would be totally rejected. They are very concerned about popular blogs, for example, because they have influence and they create discourses and they challenge official lines and official public debates about things. Durkashan says Iran seldom blocks external websites. This month, with the elections coming, is an exception. Ordinarily, anyone can read the CNN or BBC on a computer in Tehran. The government is much more sensitive to sites written in Farsi and has shut many of them down. Iranians speak less and less and read less and less any other language than, than Persian. So there is no threat for any kind of information which is produced in anything other than Persian. Businesses are also threatening internet freedom. In the past, we used to associate Western high-tech corporations with wiring the world and you know opening up uh, worlds of information for people, connecting individuals worldwide. But now they're increasingly doing the opposite. So that it's, it's that the tables have turned. In China, Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft have all agreed to keyword filtering and self-censorship. And U.S. companies like Cisco and Smart Filter have provided some of the advanced technology to police the net. I think, you know, how that battle will unfold over time, it's open-ended. And that's why it's very important for citizens not to take the Internet for granted, but to protect the net as a, sor as a source of freedom of expression and access to information. Internet access is an issue close to the hearts of our Global Village Voices. After all, without the net, how would they make their voices heard? There is a tremendous dilemma for Arab governments. On the one hand, they will use technology and internet technology in order to monitor and survey the population and trace dangerous or unacceptable discourse to its sources. But on the other hand, Technology is also the weapon that can be used to counter the propaganda of the government to go around to break the monopoly of thought and media that is being imposed on the Arab people by Arab government, especially with Saudi money in this respect. I wish that business would get on the side of the users, people that are trying to express themselves, instead of being on the side of governments that are trying to limit freedom of expression. I'm sure there's millions of people living in countries uh, where there is lack of freedom of the internet. And if businesses could create tools to help them access the websites they want, I'm sure there would be a huge market for those tools. So I'm hoping that, that businesses move on to the right side of freedom of expression instead of supporting so